welcome to the show. Our guest today is the Honorable Judge Pat Wilkie, Josephine County Circuit Court Judge. We'll be talking a little bit about uh, mental health today. Welcome to the show, Judge Wilkie. Thank you, Andy. Delighted to be with you. Okay, so today I'd like for us to take a look at the state of mental health today or and kind of get to know it a little bit better and what we can do and what's going on. A lot of us have people close to us that we need to uh, know how to deal with their situations and what's going on in places that usually it's hard to find information. So before we get started with that, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, I was born and raised in Grants Pass. Mm -hmm. I went to Grants Pass High School then I went to the University of Oregon, got a degree in economics, went to law school at Lewis and Clark, became a lawyer, practiced out in Eastern Oregon for quite a while, met my wife out there, eventually moved back to Grants Pass in 1994, became a judge in 2004, and have been doing it ever since. Okay, I've, I've seen you uh, at some of the events that I go to for the mental health uh, community. What sparked your interest? What got you uh, advocating for that? Well, I've been a lawyer now for a lawyer or a judge for over 41 years, and mm -hmm. I've seen the interaction of the criminal justice system and mentally ill in court, mm -hmm. and it's never been a good fit. Right. And I, I thought one day I was driving to work and I heard a, a public broadcasting show on mental health courts, and I thought, well, that is very interesting and maybe we could try something like that in Josephine County. And we got together, had a group of people that are interested in doing that in February 2008, and we actually started our mental health court in February 2009. We've been operating it ever since. And uh, the good thing about a mental health court is it's a way to get people that are in the criminal justice system just because they have a serious and persistent mental illness and they're, they're committing minor crimes over and over again to try to get them out of the system. What I always say to new participants in mental health court is, our goal is to get you out of the criminal justice system forever so that you're never gonna have to come back and go to jail, mm. see the judge, see the police. You're just gonna live a quiet life and you're gonna engage in mental health services instead of criminal justice services. So it's, it's kind of places a way to get treatment to the person instead of putting them in a position where uh, they don't have access to that or they're learning some behaviors that are not gonna be beneficial to them. The, the process before a mental health court in Josephine County mm -hmm. was that you basically treat a, a mentally ill person just like anybody else in the system. So they would enter a plea or go to trial. Mm -hmm. They would uh, be put on probation they would say you have to spend some time in jail, you have to pay some money, and that, you know, and you have to do certain things that they, because of their mental illness, oftentimes they're psychotic, mm -hmm. they just wouldn't follow through. And so the natural result is they get rearrested, mm -hmm. or they go out and commit a brand new crime, and it's just a, a really vicious cycle that is a resource waster, and it's very hard on the mentally ill person. Are there things that the courts are doing now or that the system is putting in place now to kind of see the reality with the people that are dealing with uh, a mental health issue? Yes. It, it, Andy, it's a big problem and it's getting bigger. I don't know if we can access our first chart. Okay, can we see that first slide, please? That is, okay. There, we, that's okay. That shows a response to the mentally ill, serious mentally ill in court, and that is the creation of mental health courts in Oregon. And we in Josephine County, the yellow counties are the counties with mental mm -hmm. health courts. And we in Josephine County started ours in 2008 in Multnomah County, which okay. is Portland. They started theirs, and also in, in uh, 2009. Uh, the very first one was Clackamas County, which is mm -hmm. Oregon City. Okay, there's another slide uh, that I'd like to take a look at right now. 
So this right here. Okay. That, so. That's a good demonstration in, in very succinctly as mm -hmm. to what the problem is. In the general population, there's only 5% of the people that have serious and persistent mental illnesses. And those are things like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, schizoaffective disorder, and sometimes PTSD. Only 5% in the general population. But when you get to the jail or prison, it's 17%. And that's not because people with a serious and persistent mental illness are more criminal. It's because that they don't get intercept, they don't get treatment anywhere else until they finally get arrested and they go to jail, and finally they go to prison. The final uh, chart shows that of those folks, 72% uh, of them have a co-occurring disorder, which makes things uh, a lot tougher as far as their recovery. Co-occurring disorder, sometimes called dual diagnosis, is the combination of a substance abuse problem and a serious mental illness. So. Back in the old days, people, let's say a 19-year-old young man had his first psychotic break because of schizophrenia, a natural reaction would be to take some kind of mind-altering street drug to try to avoid that, that problem, and that could lead to alcohol or marijuana or something like that. Those kind of street drugs are totally counterproductive to recovery for the serious and mentally ill, and that's a big problem. Okay, so self-medicate right is there a part is there a, a part where uh, the diagnosis has something to do with it what they're already uh, getting help with or is there a part where uh, access to the medications that it takes to deal with that chemical imbalance is just not working in right. the system right now. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Our, our mental health system is basically broken. Mm -hmm. There's so many barriers to getting effective treatment for mental illness, starting with uh, getting a correct diagnosis. Once you get a correct diagnosis, getting the correct medicine and the correct dosage. Uh, there's barriers to getting housing. There's barriers to getting uh, jobs for the mentally ill. and it, the problem is getting bigger and bigger. I mean, back in the 1980s, there weren't 17% of the, the jail population, prison population that were seriously mentally ill. It was about 8%. So it's getting bigger and bigger. And because it's getting bigger, the folks back in Washington, D.C. and here in the state of Oregon understand that they have to do something about it. There, there's a lot of avenues that they use to try to address the problem, and one, one of the oldest is mental health courts. Mm -hmm. And there are other things like, there's something called assisted outpatient treatment, which is a new law in Oregon since 2012, which basically is like a mental health court for somebody who has not committed a crime but are suffering from a serious and persistent mental illness and not getting treatment. So, um, how, do we, how do we get the community to take a better look at this? to take, you know, take a closer look and see where those pieces can be put into place. Because if it's growing, that means that something's not being paid attention to. Right. You know what I've noticed, Andy, is that unless you have a loved one or somebody that's close to you that has such a, like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, the rest of the population just really does not want to wade into those subjects. They, you know, they have enough problems of their own, they just kind of ignore the problem. But uh, you and I know about a group in Southern Oregon called National Alliance on Mental Illness. Yes, sir. They're a great group, and they're the people that really understand what the problem is and are trying to do something about the problem, so we're both supporters of that. Yes, I know that being a part of NAMI and dealing with them over the last eight years or so, I've, I've realized that there's a stigma in there, and I've also realized how huge uh, the population is that also knows somebody yes. who is dealing with a mental health yes. issue. Right. So if if there are ten people in a room, somebody in that room is dealing with a health issue. Probably four of those people. Yeah. So it's close to all of us. Yes. So how do we let people realize that it's? How do we uh, move away from the stigma of pushing it behind me? or I'm just not gonna talk about it, or I'm gonna put these people over here to, the, to take an action to actually make things better for the community and for the person that 
that's our friend or our mm -hmm. loved one. You're right, Andy. There are a lot of people that have friends or relatives or loved ones that have serious mental illnesses, and but there's there's a lot of ignorance I've found about really how somebody gets an illness like that. And I think as a starting point, people need to realize that people with a serious and persistent mental illness didn't make any mistake. They didn't do anything wrong to get the illness. They just got it. Mm -hmm. So unlike many problems that we have in our society, and in particular in the criminal justice system, uh, these folks really haven't done anything to put themselves in a bad situation. We have a lot of people that do. Uh, the mentally ill don't. We need to, as a starting point, we need to understand that. And we need to understand that there is effective treatment for mental illness. And oftentimes it revolves around correct medication. Okay. And that's, that's what people should understand. Okay. So as, as I've, I have a, someone who's really close to me that is going through a crisis, but they can't stay with me. Mm -hmm. because I don't know how to deal with the crisis right. uh, or I'm nervous. I, I just don't know what to do. What are the options? Well, we in Josephine County, we have a mental health department called Options. Mm -hmm. They have helplines, and, and anybody with a serious mental illness can walk into Options. And I, I know over in Jackson County, you have a mental health department. It's a little in transition, but same. I'm sure the same would apply. Anybody with an illness like that can go in and get services. It really helps if the person happens to qualify for the Oregon Health Plan. Mm -hmm. If they don't, they can work through the process of maybe qualifying for the Oregon Health Plan. But that's, that's a really good start because if you engage in services with the mental health department, you can get a medicine appointment. Mm -hmm. So a doctor, medical doctor can look at you and look at your records and figure out what would be a correct medicine to try. Mm -hmm. And you can get caseworking services. They have employment work, so uh, many people want to get a job and just be normal, and they can help you with that. They can help you with supported education. We have a lot of folks that go to Rogue Community College, and, and I'm sure over here at SOU. Uh, so step one would be to, to try the local mental health department. The problem is that there, one, one side effect of, of mental illness oftentimes is something called anosognosia. And that is fancy Latin for the phrase of the illness takes away your ability to even understand that you're mentally right. ill. And if you have anosognosia and somebody says you need to go to the mental health department to get services and start taking medicine, the natural reaction is why would I do that? Because, you know, I, I'm not mentally ill. Right. And those are the folks that, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, we, in Oregon, we have kind of a hands-off approach to them. There's such, such a thing called civil commitment, mm -hmm. uh, but that is rarely used in Oregon. We have an almost impossible criteria. Can you tell us a little bit about civil commitment and, and exactly what that means? Well, what it means, the net result of a civil commitment, if you, if you are civilly committed, is that you're under the jurisdiction of the Oregon Health Authority for 180 days. And usually the first part of that 180 days is some kind of inpatient place. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't force you to take medicine. They can encourage you to take medicine. But the way it goes is that uh, the, the legal definition is that you have to have a mental illness. You have to be a danger to yourself or a danger to others or unable to provide for your basic personal needs. So that's all our statute says. It's very vague. And what has happened over the years is that our Court of Appeals has taken that very vague definition and have, has refined it and refined it so that it's very, very tough to get somebody civilly committed. For example, the phrase, unable to provide for your basic personal needs, has been interpreted by our Court of Appeals to mean that you're about to die in the near future because you're unable to provide for your basic personal wow. needs. So that's why very few people that have the anosognosia and that are not engaging voluntarily in treatment don't get mm -hmm. civilly committed because uh, there's just no teeth to the law. Okay, when I'm listening to you and I even consider, I know civil commitment is something that helps and that I'm sure a lot of people's loved ones would, would hope for uh, a way to, to get the people they care about into a space where they can be helped. Isn't there, a shortage of space? Oh, absolutely. I mean, 
we've got we've we've had a complete 180 degree turn when it comes mm -hmm. to bed space for the mentally ill. Mm -hmm. Back in the 50s and 60s in Oregon, we had 5,000 beds, inpatient beds for the mentally ill. Now we have about 500. And that's true around the country, about 10% of what we used to have. And there, there's good and bad about that. The, the bad was that back in the old days, it was pretty easy to be civilly committed and you could just stay in an institution for a long period of time. Supreme Court said, you can't do that anymore. We had federal legislation that, that was provided for community mental health treatment as opposed to inside an institution. The problem is that we still have a lot of people that need some kind of bed space, and we just don't have the beds. We have the Oregon State Hospital, we have uh, the Rogue Valley, Rogue Valley Medical Center, and uh, a few other places like that, but we have very few beds for the mentally ill. It's always a problem. So, well, what happens to those people from, from 5,000 to 500? Right. What happens to those people? Well, drive down any street in any community and you'll see the people. And unfortunately, they're, that's, that's how the community gets the wrong idea, I think. They think they're just panhandlers and uh, drunks. And oftentimes, they're people that have a serious mental illness and have the co-occurring disorder. And because we have our hands off legal policy in Oregon, nobody has ever intervened in their lives. And Pretty soon, after you know a long period of addiction and a long period of untreated schizophrenia or whatever it is, those people are pretty hard to turn around. And so we're going to see more and more folks like that on our streets, in our parks, and so on. Unless we start putting some services in place and putting some space where they can get some assistance. Absolutely. Right? Okay. So um, how can how do you? Uh, look at the the panhandler on the street how do you look at the the guy in his shanty over there in the in the green green belt how do you know that 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 we're that we're uh, that there are services how do you get the services to those people i guess that's what i really yeah. want to know how yeah. do you get to good that? question i mean what I think we need in Oregon is a little more effective civil commitment statute mm -hmm. and involuntary treatment statutes because for people with anosognosia that don't acknowledge that they have a mental illness, not because they're in denial, but because they sincerely don't believe they have a mental illness because of the, the illness, uh, they're, you know, they're never going to walk into a mental health department and say, I need a medicine appointment. They're never going to get treatment for drugs and alcohol, I don't think. And you know some of those people, I'm sure, are not mentally ill. But but uh, if we had a more effective way to intercept their kind of downward spiral, because in mental health court we see all the time people are that in the downward spi mm -hmm. spiral and they get intercepted and they get in recovery, they get sober, they they take a me their medicine, they get jobs, they get housing. So it, we've seen in mental health courts it, it can definitely turn people around and get them out of that rut. But the longer it goes on, the more difficult it is to turn things around. So you're, you're talking early intervention. I am. I'm, okay. I, there's science out there that says that uh, uh, if, you, if a person, for example, has schizophrenia, and that usually comes around the 20s or late teens, and right after the first psychotic break, if you can get intervention right then, the chance mm. for recovery is much, much better. Conversely, if you do the hands-off thing and you just stand back and let them, you know, honor their civil liberties, let them do what, do their thing, and you let them for five or six or seven years, pretty soon it's going to be irretrievable. It's going to be very hard to overcome because baseline for a mentally ill person that doesn't take medicine, their baseline or their highest level of functioning goes down every time they, they quit taking medicine. Okay, so I'm hearing you say don't stand off, don't push it aside, take some action as soon as you recognize yeah. that something's going on. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I'm a veteran. As, as thank you for yourself, your service. And thank you for your service. There's a, uh, a lot of vets coming back now and even our older vets that were in Vietnam and and all mm -hmm. Korea, all those wars have have some uh, issues 
yes. reintegrating into right. society after you've been in a situation like that. Even just the military kind of does that to you. Our, I, I asked you about Veterans Court earlier, and you're telling me that there can be some uh, relief for veterans also in mental health court. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our qualifying, one of the qualifying mental illnesses for a mental health court, at least our mental health court, is PTSD. Mm -hmm. We've had several veterans. In fact, we just had a graduation ceremony on Friday for a, a Marine veteran who was suffering from PTSD and was using substances and is now clean and sober and doing great. So, yeah, PTSD pops up a lot. And that, that keeps people, because mental health court is there, it keeps people out of the criminal justice system so they can have a normal life, yes, right? Yes, that, that's so, our absolute yeah. goal, you know, out of the criminal justice system forever mm -hmm. into, you know, a good, quiet life. Okay. Um, how can the community, if, if you were to say, okay, these things are, are things that the community can look at, uh, as far as mental health issues with people that are in your community, where would you tell them to start? What needs to happen in Oregon is we need to have law changes. We need to better define the civil commitment statute. So they, I think they should start with their legislature mm -hmm. and legislators. And I think they also should support groups like NAMI because there, there are mental health groups and there are other mental health groups some mental health groups are so broad that they really don't understand or get involved with the serious and persistent mental illness, and that's what NAMI does. And so National Alliance for Mental Illness, that's what they do, and that's, they should be supported. Yeah, I, th I think we've got about, what, five minutes left. So before we leave, I just want to go over this. Again, I think this information is something that people should really be aware yes. of and take a look at. So, can you exp can you talk a little bit about this again? Yeah, it just it demonstrates the problem is big. The problem is getting bigger because we shouldn't have 17% of our prison inmates and 17% of our jail inmates. That's an average around the nation mm -hmm. that have serious and persistent mental illness. There, that shows me that they're in prison and jail because they're serious and persistent mental illness is untreated. And we need that space. People with serious and persistent mental illness, it's very hard on the jail personnel, the prison personnel. They, they're very expensive inmates. It's very hard on them. Uh, if, you're, if you're psychotic and you're in a, a locked facility and there's a lot of voices going on down the hallway, it's very, very counterproductive for somebody that's trying to recover from mental illness. So, uh, you know, if we only have 5% in our general population, 17% in our jails and prisons, something is drastically long, wrong. Yeah. And luckily, in the federal level, there's been a recognition of that. There's mm -hmm. a brand new law called the Helping Families and Mental Health Crisis Act, mm -hmm. which President Obama signed into law on December 7th. And that is going to shift resources to the seriously mentally ill. Okay. So when I look at this, and I've been trying to think of, how we can uh, get this back out to the people. When we talk about uh, people in being housed that are dealing with a mental health issue, being housed in the jail, the issue that comes up or the problem that comes up to me, and I've talked to a few people about this, is how do they get access to their medication? Yes. There's, it, how, how does that happen? It's, a, it's a big issue. Mm -hmm. It's a problem because psychiatric medicines are often expensive the jail doesn't want to just spend a whole lot of money mm -hmm. in psychiatric medicines sometimes they don't have an active prescription they've been off their medicine so they don't have an active prescription in Josephine County we get a grant a jail diversion grant we have people in jail that address mm -hmm. that problem but most jails don't and it's a it's a real problem okay because I've heard a lot about that and people that I know who have been had encounters with the law who are dealing with issues say mm -hmm. I couldn't get my medication in jail I'm having how am I gonna get out of here it, I'm it's, a problem. it's yeah so it's it's a big big issue so and all that would be a legislation we need to just pay attention to our legislators or 
and talk, right? What I think, Andy, is that, mm -hmm. like I say, unless you have a loved one or somebody close to you that has this type of illness, in legislatures, I don't, I don't think they do. You know, when, when <laughs> right. I talk to the legislatures, I kind of get a glassy eye stare when I talk about this issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got to find a way. Yes, I just know that we've got to find a way. We've only got about a minute left here. If there's something you'd like to say to the audience, uh, we've got about a minute for that. You have a brand new court and you have a brand new mental health court in Jackson County and it's, it's presided over by Judge Lisa Greif. And I think you should support Judge Greif in doing that. Uh, and it's, she, we have about 22 mental health courts around the state of Oregon and they're going to be, we're going to have more and more because as, as we've said, the problem is getting bigger and bigger. Okay. Um, so thank you for being with us today, Judge Wilkie. I want to thank all the volunteers that helped put this show on. Thank you. Uh, and we will see you the next time. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Andy. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you.